Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us again today. As usual, Quentin D'Souza is here with me. Quentin, how are you? Hey, good. How about yourself? I am awesome. I am doing really, really well today. I feel like a million bucks. I don't oh, look like good. a million bucks, but I feel like a million bucks. Oh, that's good. I feel I feel really good too. I'm uh, I just came back from a, a workout and uh, I'm heading to Iceland next week to do a 10 day trip um, up, uh, you know, mountainscapes and through some glaciers and, you know, some volcanic uh, areas. So it should be a, a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward wow. to that. Yeah, that sounds good. really cool. Yeah, but you know, for those of you who don't know, Quentin, the only work Quentin does anymore is this. That's it. Now he's he's off doing uh, yeah. what? What is it? Um, forest bathing and uh, <laughs> and whatever, and all this hiking and and exploring that you're doing. Yeah, no, I mean, it should, certainly, you know, I've got 580 some odd units. It keeps me pretty busy, I gotta say. But I've structured my you know, the way that I do things with the um, employees that I have and the partners that I have and all that makes it a lot easier for me to, to be able to, um, you know, do these other things, right? right. I'm, I'm certainly well, busy, for sure. And you, and you couldn't do that stuff. You couldn't manage that many units alone. No, definitely so. not. Um, uh, for those of you who haven't done so, please go over to BreakthroughREIPodcast.ca uh, listen to all of our past shows, hook up, not hook up, uh, I guess, get in contact with our uh, past guests. Uh, maybe if you're lucky, hook up. I don't know. Hey, man, hook up being something different to this generation as opposed to. Yeah, I, I guess that's why I'm like, I, you, I keep like, saying it like that. Okay. But uh, anyway, you know, get in contact with our past guests and uh, and all that info is over there at breakthroughreipodcast.ca. And then if you haven't done so, go over to iTunes and leave a rating or review. I've got a review to read here right now. Quinn's on top of this stuff. He, uh, he sent me this, someone just left a review. Five stars, no surprise really, but five stars. It says, fantastic podcast, great hosts, great guests, great information. Highly recommend this podcast for any aspiring or experienced real estate investors. That was by Jordan oh, Walsack, Walsiak, Jordan well, Walsiak. Thank you. Thanks, thank Jordan. You, Jordan. We appreciate everybody who leaves us a review, uh, really helps us in our ratings. And, you know, if you found this, if you find this uh, podcast interesting, please share it with a, a friend, because uh, the only way to get this uh, out yeah, there is the point. Like Go over it. and leave us a rating and review, please. Yep. All right. All uh, right. I wanted to bring up Absolutely. Can you still hear the... me? Am I yeah. still there? Yes, yes, we still hear you for sure. Uh, it's glitching on my end, so I just wasn't sure. So um, the, yeah, you, a... want, you had a couple of things. What's what's going on with you, Quentin? What's new? Tell uh, us some stuff. Well, I've been I've been warning people about promissory notes for the last few episodes and over the years, but um, another investor daniel daniel st john um is being investigated by the uh, ontario securities commission um he is a realtor but also a real estate investor and runs a, a real estate club out in the west end of the gta and um he has raised more than 25 million dollars this is a globe and mail article um, more than $25 million in promissory notes from small investors and has uh, stalled projects. Uh, I've been getting his emails over the years, actually. And uh, the last time I got an email from him was in July. And he was looking for funds, I believe, for a renovation. And before that, he was looking for funds for projects in, um, I'm not sure exactly what country. Maybe it was Costa Rica. But he was, um, he was, he, it was all unsecured. So he was looking for funds, but he was going to, to build uh, or do some development projects in, um, I believe, on the East Coast and in South America somewhere or Central America somewhere. And um, this is exactly what, you know, without any security, um, 
all these people are, well, they haven't been paid and um, the Ontario Securities Commission is is doing that investigation. Um, the, well, they can have, I ask you something? Yeah, go ahead. How do you kick the can down the road like this so successfully? How, how does that happen? Only for so long, right? Because you're borrowing money to pay off. But he's off been doing this for years, right? Yeah, but there's a certain point where you know you have to keep filling the um, the bottom with new promissory notes, and if you can't do that, then eventually you're you're going to find it. You can't keep up, and you know I've I've heard through other investors, you know about his business practices and you know I, I I did have him once speak at Durham REI a long time ago but I, I haven't uh, since then and I, and um, you know I, you just never know what's happening with people right and and what they what they do but you get to know you know people and their business practices over over time right um, and uh, usually you hear the same sort of names come up within you know different issues uh, whether it's like a, you know a mortgage broker's name like Claire, what's her name Claire Draj or Draj. Anyway, she she had corporate bankruptcy and personal bankruptcy, and she had raised private mortgages and prom notes from Rob for Robbie Clark for other people uh, who've ha um, also had different issues. Not saying that this is you know something that she did as well. But um, it's just the, the process is the same. So people have to be careful of promissory notes because they're only so what, as good as the paper that they're written on. And, you know, it could could in mean, some cases, right? Yeah, in some cases, yeah. it could be very problematic. Um, oh, I can't remember what I was going to ask you. Was, oh, what sparked the investigation? Um, complaints from people not being paid. So there are a number okay. of investors that weren't being paid. And, um, you know, the amount of funds borrowed on different projects are literally in the hundreds. Uh, at least that's what it looks like. Um, you know, raised $12 million with 139 promissory notes, 109 investors on 13 and a half million on promissory notes. It's a lot of people. So things to uh, watch out for. Wow. Yeah, cra cra crazy. Crazy stuff. And did you hear about Trudeau? Like the latest? <laughs> I, I try <laughs> not to hear. Plan? I try. I no? try to just look, man. What there's, you know, I'm over here now, so I just I try to. Don't worry. I, yeah, it invades my space. Go on. Let's talk about it. Well, well, you know, he, you know, he his housing plan. He can't, tends to announce things over and over again every year. It seems and seems to be something similar. Uh, this time, uh, and not that he hasn't announced using federal land for, you know, creating affordable housing, because if you look back in his previous, you know, things that he's talked about, you know, he, he's talking about the same thing and, and other governments have talked about the same thing as well, except he wants to land lease these houses. Ever, anybody heard of a land lease before? So if you're if you're not aware of land leases like sometimes in in provincial parks you might get like a land lease where somebody has a cottage on a on land and the land is basically you know you you have it for 100 years but you, you know at, at at the end of that 100 years anybody else can kind of or that the person that owns it or the, the the federal government that owns it can take it back that's exactly what he's proposing it's almost like having getting into the condo business basically right like um where they but instead the federal government still owns the the land very interesting um you know to hear these sort of things come from the trudeau government really like you know my opinion and this is just my opinion it's just let the investors do their job stop vilifying investors and and let them help to create housing in uh, in Canada, right? Because that's what they usually do when they're not hampered by uh, governments that seem to uh, create more bureaucracy and stop that, right? So, you know, that's a healthy- Well, that's without knowing too much about this, without knowing too much about this, um, 
like on paper, it doesn't sound so, like such a bad idea, you know, but I'm sure it doesn't pan out the way that, uh, that, you know, in, in, in all a positive way. Well, I mean, they're, they're kind of, I, guess... I mean, the idea is affordable housing. So I'm sure that they're, they're like the, the land lease rate would be probably, you know, a lot less, let's say, than, than rent, maybe. Well, who's like, who's going to be, is the, is the federal government going to be the developer? Are they going to pay a developer to do this? Like, what, what is that going to look like? Where's the incentives in, in, in this particular, in these projects anyways? It'll be interesting to actually hear our, our uh, guests, uh, you know, point of view on, on, uh, on this, because this is yeah right up, you know, his alley, but um, uh, just uh Maybe we can do a, a little bit of an introduction here for sure. For our yeah. Guests. So um, Luke Wyrett is a professional engineer. Uh, he is a, also a PMP, uh, a PMI. He started his first construction at project at the age of fourteen. He left the industry to pursue a career in nuclear and mechanical engineering and uh, was a project lead at OPG, overseeing projects there. Uh, he has a passion for construction and um, you know, started his life as an entrepreneur in the custom home building space. He used his technical and business know-how and previous work experience to you know, scale and that grew into LCH developments. And he is uh, as company CEO and COO. He's responsible for real estate development projects, acquisitions, municipal approvals, construction management and operations. And he's a registered builder uh, with Terrier. So, without further ado, I know that uh, you know there. There is also the elevate construction management piece and a few other pieces. Uh, but uh, I wanted to introduce Luke Wyrett. Thanks for being here. Yes, <clears throat> hello. Thank you for having me on. Sounds sounds like you read that off of like some kind of company profile or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Luke has been on the show before, but it was over mm -hmm. six years ago. You know that? Oh, wow. So there's a lot. A lot has changed since then. Yeah. But no, thanks for coming back. Yeah. No yeah. problem. Glad to be back. I think I've known you for probably like. I don't know, like 14 years or something like that. I, I think I think it was a, during our rain days and it was 2006, I believe, is when we met. Wow. So that's crazy. So that's, yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while since we've known each other, maybe even yeah. earlier. Yeah, yeah. And I was at your wedding too. And that was that was a blast. That was so much fun. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, before we go. You know, let's instead of going back, let's get let's go forward and kind of, um, you know, get a, a little bit about maybe you can give us a little bit about your journey to where you, you know, got to today, because you're doing some amazing projects. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll give you like a, just a big uh, a brief history. Uh, I started basically right after school. I got a job as an engineer. And I started buying real estate. I had some joint venture partners and we started buying in Hamilton at the time, student rentals. We did a uh, rent to own duplexes, triplexes. Did that for about uh, four, four years, I would say. I uh, got up to, we, you know, at a, at a certain point, I owned about 30 rental properties, managed them all myself, still had my full time job. Uh, so it was at that point I decided, you know what, I don't really want to be. Uh, well, first of all, I didn't need to be working a full-time job. And I also didn't want to uh, be buying more rentals. I wanted to focus on something that I'd like to do, which is construction and development. So I went into building custom homes. Uh, we, we built a few custom homes in the Toronto area. After that, we would buy lots, take the lot, split it in two, build two semis or two detached homes. Uh, then we would take a lot, maybe divide it into four. We did a few of those projects. 
Uh, then we got it, got into bigger projects. So we did a 16 uh, unit townhouse project. Uh, there was an interesting one that we did a church conversion. So we took an old church and if we did 14 kind of like luxury boutique um, uh, units inside of that. Uh, we did uh, we did a few other projects. One other project that we just kind of took to approvals, um, and then we sold it off. So we and then uh, our last project that we started in 2017, uh, we just finished construction on it last August. So it was registered last August, and it was 190 units. Um, so 190 homes that people moved into. Uh, so we're, we're glad to be done that one. And currently we have four projects that we're working on actively uh, at various stages in the development process. Wow, it's a lot going on there. That's incredible that it takes that. I, I mean, I know it's a lot of units and everything, but you said you started in 2017. 2017 is when we started acquiring the, the sites. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we went through approvals that took us into late 2019. I think 2020 is when we started um, uh, construction. Uh, 2020 started construction, then that took about just under three years. Cool. And, you're, and you're really land banking at that point, right? Like you're trying, you're picking up those pieces, but holding on to them and, you know, running through the processes in order to, to be able to, to do these larger developments. Uh, yeah, that's right. You try to you try to buy them either for and you try to get great terms. Um, that was kind of the way that I've always I've done most of my projects is ahead of time. We know these things are going to take a few years, so let's do a really long closing. Or you know, if we can't do that, let's try to get a pretty good price from the vendor if we have to close like within sixty days. Uh, so you do like an option is are you doing options on the land like for three years or something like that and uh, we have done options before but we have done options before but usually it's just an extended closing so like closing one year out with an option to extend uh, two times six months uh, each time ah. so you're buying now and it's got like a two you know two year uh basically closing closing time you tell the vendor, yeah, you know, if we get approvals quicker, we'll close quicker. Uh, but, you know, Toronto being what it is, it being the slowest municipality in all of North America to get approvals, wow. uh, you know, it's not going to happen in a year. It's not going to happen in two years. It'll take you at least three years. Three years. So you do. You, so you do end up closing on these properties with these options, even though you're not ready. But you you have a good sense of where you're where you're gonna go to. I I have a feeling by the end of that's year right. Two, right. That's right. Yeah. Have there been any uh, land parcels you've had to let go? Uh, no, no. Um, all of them. Usually, we have a let's say three to six month due diligence condition when we buy these uh, when we're buying these properties. So we would meet up with the city, tell them what our plan is. And in, you know, concept wise, they'll be okay with it. Like if they're not okay with it, then uh, actually, you know what? There wasn't one development that we did let go. I forgot about that one. That one was in uh, Stoneville. That was, uh, that was like five, six years ago. We had a big lot. We were gonna do six single family homes. The city wasn't a fan of it, so we're like, so we kind of just we, you know, we, uh, the consultant cost, whatever, and we just kind of moved on from that. There's no sense in fighting with the city, because then you're into, uh, then you're going into the Ontario Land Tribunal, and municipal lawyers they are a thousand bucks an hour, eleven hundred dollars an hour. And so it sounds to me about like about a week. That you're in front of the tribunal, <laughs> maybe wow. two weeks. Whoa! But the concept yeah, they, approval doesn't take that long. That's that's a pretty streamlined process. It's not bad. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's uh, you have some plans. You go in front of the uh, city. You usually your urban design is going to be there, maybe engineering, planning department. You're like, okay, this is what we're thinking. And they'll be like, oh, okay, you know what? Yeah, that, you know, more or less, that's kind of uh, good, but we want you to change this, that, 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 that. And you, you have a good sense. 
you go back to the drawing board, you make your official submission, and then you wait for comments. And then you're going back and forth. And sometimes you can be dealing with the city. Uh, you know, it takes for site plan approval. You'll be on your fourth or fifth uh, resubmission before you finally get your like site plan agreement. Mm -hmm. How long and does so that take? Is that like a, within a year or? Two and a half, two and a half years. So that's two just years, the site plan. Wow. That's the site plan approval, yeah. Oh, the site plan approval is what takes the long time. That's the longest time. Zoning. So why does it take so? Let's let's get into this. Why does it take so long? Why is Toronto in this spot that they're in, having that reputation for builders and developers? Uh, the amount of okay, there's a few reasons, but the amount of studies that's required. Uh, they previously they have been understaffed. So it took them, you know, on some of our applications, uh, it, it took them eight months before they were able to send us official comments after our first after our first site plan submission. Uh, it took them eight months to get us comments back because they were just so backlogged. Uh, but so that that and also they're very none of the departments talk with each other, mm. and. You know, uh, engineering department might want this, planning department might want that, urban design, and then there's urban forestry, and you're trying to figure out all these uh, all these issues. And it's not like you, you can say, you know what, everybody, let's get on a call, let's get a, you know, let, let's set up a meeting, let's hash this up. It doesn't work like that. It's very difficult to get everyone in the same room at the city of Toronto. So then you got to make another submission. And then you wait a, a month or a couple months and you'll get comments back. Hopefully it's a few less comments. You make another submission. And then at the fourth submission, usually you and the planner, and, or as, as long as engineering and the planner is happy, then you're good. It's so crazy. And, and then, cause we had a guest on from Edmonton and she does <laughs> infill development. And, you know, she was saying that the, the like, it takes literally three months for her to get uh, anything done. <laughs> like, and and she was, what, eight, was it eight unit buildings they were doing? Yeah, six or eight unit buildings and like over and over again, right? Edmonton sounds like a dream. I heard that <laughs> their, their development charges are probably some of the lowest in Canada and their timelines are probably some of the fastest. But they're able sure. to turn things over. Wow. So so you're so what are those charges and fees that that you face in, in the GTA, like when you're planning on doing a development? Ah, oh, those fees. Those fees. Whenever I look at that number on the form format, uh, it makes me it makes me cringe. It makes me cringe. Uh, I, I actually wrote an article about this on LinkedIn about, uh, you know, comparing, comparing the develop, uh, development charges or the fees that the city, cities charge in all of North America. Um, so I took, you know, New York City, Miami, Chicago, Seattle, LA, San Francisco, uh, Calgary, Montreal, Vancouver, and I believe Ottawa and Toronto. And out of all of those cities, um, taking into account even the exchange rate between the US and the dollar, uh, Toronto had the highest fees in all of North America. Uh, second was Vancouver. Third was San Francisco. Wow. New York, New York City, like Seattle, some of these other places, their fees were, were uh, uh, much lower. I think. Uh, I, so what did I do? I, I took a 220 unit, 220 unit building, 150 about 150 thousand square feet, and I calculated what the fees would be in each of those cities. In Toronto, it was 18 million dollars uh, in fees that you'll be paying to the city of Toronto. Uh, Vancouver was uh, around 15, 16, and I think San Francisco was about uh, 14, 15. Uh, and then other places like, you know, Texas, Austin, Texas, it was about 1 million. Calgary was about one and a half million. Halifax was one and a half as well. 
Uh, Montreal was five million. You know, so like you got it's it's all over the place. But Toronto, Vancouver, highest in all of North America. And and the population sizes, like it, it makes no sense because if you take some of those populations that you have, like like you were mentioning, San Francisco and Texas. They're they have population sizes very similar to to what I would say is you know Toronto, right? That's right. Yeah. Oh, and one other thing. One other thing. Uh, the in the U.S. they don't have sales tax on new construction homes. There's no sales tax at, at all uh, in in Toronto and all of Canada. I think Alberta you just pay the federal portion, but we have that HST. HST tax. So that adds another, um, uh, what is it, about $50,000 a unit to the purchase price. Wow. So what percentage is like fees and charges that are like governmental, like of a, let's say you're going to buy a unit that's, that costs $500,000, let's say. What per, how much of that $500,000 unit is, is going to be like fees? And charges yeah, that so a five hundred thousand dollar unit that would be uh, about one hundred and seventy thousand is just fees HST and the and like city of Toronto fees. Wow, that's that's a crazy amount. That's like like thirty five percent or yeah, it's wild. It's wild. That's why that's why housing so is, is like new new construction is expensive. So so what keeps you okay? I, this is more this is a little off track. What keeps you in the GTA then? Like why why not go to a different market and you know it's it's easier or it's less expensive? Um, it's a good question. We are we are looking into it. We are looking into other markets. Uh, we started off in this market just because of the strong uh, economic fundamentals. Uh, it, you know, when we started out, the fees weren't as as crazy. Uh, they were much less. But over the past like seven years, you know, just in this past May, the city of Toronto increased the fees by twenty percent. Um, wow! A few years ago, a few years before that, they increased it by another. I think it was fifty percent. And there's no right, there's no reason why the fees should be going up that high. They're 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 forcing um, they're forcing new condo or new buyers, purchasers to pay for improvements throughout the city, as opposed to, that, that benefits everybody, which you know doesn't make sense. And it shouldn't it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, you would think that it would have to do with property taxes or like you know everybody is paying for everything not just one segment of the population or one one type of you know tax ends up paying for a majority of that it's also i think it's kind of short-sighted too from a municipal perspective because you know that means that you're always develop you're always dependent on development and that's right and if now, if you're driving all the development away, you're forced to have to raise property taxes. Hence, probably what's happening in Toronto right now. <laughs> right? Yeah, with, it's going to be interesting in the next couple of years because there hasn't been a, or there, there isn't going to be a lot of projects that, you know, get a shovel in the ground. The, the market's uh, slow right now. So the, they're budgeted amount that they think they were going to get from development charges is going to be much, much lower than what the actual, what's actually going to come in. So wow. when you take everything into account between, um, between all the cities, the development charges and everything into account, is the profit roughly the same? Like, is that why you would stay or because the sale price is going to be higher in Toronto than some of those other cities that you mentioned as well? Uh, yeah, more or less the profit is the same in the U.S. They have slightly, slightly different, but in terms of like Canada, uh, yeah, you got the profit margin between eight and twelve percent. If it's a much smaller city, you would expect a higher profit margin, but there's also mm -hmm. like more, uh, there's more risk uh, when you get into those smaller, 
so that's cities. sort of what keeps you there then right like to put eight up or with 12 all uh, no way oh, eight or 12 percent that's between, all that's that's it yeah developers don't make that much money that makes no sense mm -hmm. for all the risk that you have to take in development you get eight or ten that doesn't between even make eight, eight to twelve percent is the profit margin um so it's a high, let's say it's a 200 or hundred million dollar um, uh, project. The developers making between uh, eight and 12 million usually. If it's a great deal, it's about 15 million. Wow, I'm just totally blown away by that number. I mean, sometimes people think that like, I, I think that the perception out there is very different from the reality because I think that if you ask somebody out on the street, how much do you think the developer here makes? And they're probably thinking, oh, they're probably making 50% of the, you know, the yeah. money on, on each of these units they sell. And, you know, that's like the, like they're mega millionaires or billionaires because they're building this stuff. And it, is that the same everywhere? Like, is that profit margin the same whether we're in like Edmonton or in Texas, or is it different? Uh, in in the U.S., it's it's higher. Um, it the U.S. is its own beast. It's different. It's a lot more. There's uh, it's just they play a different game over there. The profit margins are higher. That uh, sometimes it's easier to get investment, harder to get um, loans without the uh, proper backing or proper covenants uh, over there, but the profit margins are generally higher in the US, which is why it makes it more attractive. There it's between 15 and 20%. Right, okay. Even so 15 or 20%, that's, I mean, I guess when you're talking about scale and if you're building like 600 units, I can see where the, you know, and but then your timeline has to be faster if it, if it's going to be very profitable or it has to be bigger otherwise you you're just tying or you have to do multiple projects right mm -hmm. that's right otherwise like the machine just shuts down like you're not you're not putting enough into it to continue to develop are we going to see like with all, with all the projects like the the condo the so you're going to know a lot i, I what i've been seeing is that there hasn't been a lot of sales in the condo market in, in the last, I don't know, 12 months. And if you're not getting the sales, how does the, how do people get to develop? And if they aren't developing, are we creating a huge shortage of housing? And I guess there, these aren't even questions that we, <laughs> we talk, but I mean, like just talking to you, like it, I'm, I'm generally like concerned then. Yeah, I'm, I mean, um, right now, a lot of investors, I think uh, condo investors got burned with all these uh, interest rate hikes. So they're kind of, they're sitting on the sidelines. They're waiting to see what happens. Um, there's a lot of new investors that came in that didn't know what they were doing that bought these uh, projects at high prices that they'll never be able to cash flow. Uh, and, you know, this happened in 20, 2019, 2020, uh, 2021, and spring of 2022, where things were just, uh, I don't know if you remember, but things yeah. were just crazy. Projects come in, you, you sell out a project in a, in a weekend. Right. Now all these projects are starting to, um, they're starting to complete. They're, they're closing. And a lot of these people uh, that, you know, didn't know what they're doing, they thought, prices for the condos are, is always going to go up um, they can't close right now uh, they can't get the financing they don't have the you know their their condo may actually be worth two three hundred thousand less than what they bought it for so they got to come up with that extra amount of money uh, so for the next six months it's going to be uh, I, for the next six to 12 months I think it's still going to be a bit rough for condos uh, you can see single family already it's starting to pick up um, Low rise is starting to pick up. I've, I've seen some launches for low rise sites do well, uh, but condos, I think it's going to take another six to 12 months before we start to see what's any kind of significant sales. Uh, it could be longer, could be, uh, could be shorter. 
Uh, but when you look at it, let's say you look at it like two, two years, like next year, uh, late middle next year, 2026, 2027, there's gonna be no completions because nothing was sold in 2022, 2023 and 2024. Like no projects uh, really got, in, got off the ground. So there's gonna be a big, um, usually Toronto finishes 25,000 units a year. Um, 2026, we're gonna finish, I think like 5,000. 2027, I think it's even less. Uh, so there's gonna be a big supply crunch. The rents- what do you think? What do you think the rents, happen? The rents are going to go crazy. <laughs> ah, interesting. So it's good if you're an apartment building owner, in my opinion. Wow, that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah, like you, quite. <laughs> I got 25, so. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so you were mentioning that Luke, you have four projects on the go right now. Is that correct? That's right. So yeah. tell us a little bit about those. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we got four projects. They're all in the east uh, east end of Toronto. So Leslieville area and Scarborough. Uh, one of them, so I'll, I'll start the one furthest, uh, furthest east. So that's on the border of Pickering and um, it's on the border of Pickering close to the University of uh, Toronto Scarborough campus. Mm -hmm. That's uh, That one is 611 units. Wow. Uh, it's a 13 story building and we we were going to go to sales in the fall of this year, um, but uh, we're we're changing strategy on that one right now. Uh, we got another one, uh, 3291 retreat condos. That was 380 units. Uh, we were going to go to sales in the spring of next year. Uh, we're also changing strategy on that one. Hmm. Uh, then we got a uh, cliffside condos, which is basically right across from our office, right also right beside um, the project that we finished last year. Uh, that's 226 units. And we went for sales early this year uh, on that project. And then we have one other project. Uh, it's a boutique uh, luxury uh, six-story building, 50, 55 units in Leslieville area, uh, where it's kind of like a church conversion project, but we're demolishing half the church. Uh, the congregation that we partnered with, we're keeping that one half, we're renovating it for them, and behind it, we're putting a six-story building, um, so it's going to be completely separate, uh, uh, and it's a great area right beside Riverdale uh, Park. Um, so very, it's going to be high end. Wow, that is so cool. Th those all sound really interesting. You said 380? 380, 380 is uh, is the second one, 200. Yeah. So you're yeah. changing strategy. Yeah. So what does that mean? What, like, what, what's making you uh, do that? Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, we were, briefly talked about it earlier, uh, but where, you know, our analysis of where the market is, kind of what, what we see happening uh, and what we know is gonna happen in a few years from now, we're taking two of those four projects and we're gonna be converting them into uh, rental buildings. There's some great CBC programs out there. Um, uh, you know, you can get 50 year amortization, low low uh, equity requirements and um, you know we're for one of the projects we spoke with our partners about it already everyone's on board and the other project uh, we need to find like another um, I guess industry partner like a small pension fund or family office uh, to to take it to make it a, a rental building so does that that changes that changes the um, I guess that changes it for like permanently so you could never go back and decide to sell the units. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, doing speaking with CMHC, they don't they don't want it condo titled. Uh, they 
the specific programs that we're after, they want it under one uh, one title. So we wouldn't be okay. able to kind of condominiumize it and sell units, paying off a portion of the loans as we go along. Are you looking at the, like, what components of this? I, I, I know the programs that you're talking about. So you're looking for 50-year amortization, but are you also like going to take advantage of some other points in the program in order to to get a higher LTV, like like affordability or anything like that? Or are you um, not looking at yeah, those? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's the AM, I think it's the AMLP. It used to be the old RCFI program. Yeah. So we are, uh, because they, they changed the way they define affordability. Uh, a few years ago, the way CMHC defined affordability was more area specific. And you know certain areas they have very low, um, uh, let's say, very low rents because they have very low buildings in those areas, uh, very old buildings that have very low rents. Now they're now they're looking more at it as taking the average income that's in Toronto, and you you have to provide units that are about thirty percent of that um, income, and so we have some great, you know, 320, 330 square foot studio units yeah. that will rent out for 1500 bucks. Market is probably 18, 1900 bucks. Yeah. Uh, but those are affordable. We meet the, we meet those, uh, we check that box. I've, I've heard that again and again, because it's, it doesn't, it doesn't matter the size of the unit that it's the number of units and the the correlation to the average income, and right. um, and when because I, I, we have a project out in Napanee that we're 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 looking at to doing, and I'll have to connect back up with you again. But we have like a twenty unit building on a quarter of the land, and we have the ability to build like another 65 units, another 34 units, and another 24 units on that on that land. But the CMHC financing, because of the average income, makes that some of the units that we build are almost like market, market rent. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes it, it like it makes sense to to participate in the program, right? Yeah, yeah. I you know, it used to be the CMHC programs, they were much more difficult before, but they've gotten a lot better, um, which is one thing I can say, like, good on the go. Yeah, and and also, the, the this type of financing cannot be found in the U.S. That's, that's the other piece that I, I think that not everybody understands, is that we have a very unique kind of financing model, although uncompetitive, but still unique because we don't have the other insurers allowed to participate in the multifamily insurance market. Maybe we'd have even more unique products, but they just aren't yeah. allowed to. But it's it's really interesting to hear your potential there. So, I mean, there we could go in a whole bunch of different ways on this, but what are some of the things that you look at when you're underwriting a potential development? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it varies. Um, I mean, the number, the number one thing that, uh, that matters is, the, is what kind of rate that you can get, like what kind of rate that you can make on your money. Uh, we target 25% IRR on all, all our projects. Uh, so you usually you need a certain uh, scale um, uh, project in order to be able to do that. Uh, and for what we found, this used to be about 100,000 square feet. Now we're not looking at any projects less than 100 and let's say 65, 170,000 square feet. So that's that's the first thing. So it needs to be uh, have have the scale. Uh, Official plan. We wanna we wanna do projects that are more or less in line with the official plan um, of the municipality. Why is that? Just because it less bureaucracy. Less, less bureaucracy. Even though it's gonna take three years, at least the city's gonna try to work with you because you more or less 
are within the official plan. Uh, there was one project that we did. We weren't part, we weren't in the official plan. It took us six years to get approvals. Wow. But we want yeah. housing, right? Because <laughs> apparently, well, that's apparently. what they say. So um was there any more? Unlike well, the I, underwriting of a potential deal, yeah. Yeah. Was there uh, any other points in there? Uh, good areas. The other thing is like uh, buying buying sites in in area that have some kind of a you know unique uh, USP, unique selling proposition. Whether it's close to university, whether it's close to transit, whether it's you know close to like the beach. Um, you don't want to buy something in the middle of the city that doesn't have anything unique about it. When when like a downturn like this comes, it's going to be a lot more difficult to sell a project to get people excited about it. There's no specific uh, amenities in the area. That makes a lot of sense. You 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 know, otherwise it's just like every other project. And if there's thirty projects, what 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 makes yours different, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And you must face so many different municipal challenges, you know, um, maybe you can describe, give us an example of what, what those challenges kind of look like, because we, a lot of times all we're hearing from is, oh, the developers are doing this or the developers are doing that. And, and we're not really hearing the perspective of somebody who's actually doing the development. And, and like all the different challenges that you face. I know there's nimbyism, there's, you know, those are the bananas who don't don't want anything anywhere. And, uh, yeah. you know, and the, so those are, you know, the public problem. But what about, what are the municipal challenges that you have? Uh, municipal challenges there, uh, you know, it, it varies. There's... There was one project we were doing an affordable housing project uh, in, in Scarborough. It's close to the GO train station. Uh, we wanted to build a 10-story building. Uh, it was it was zoned for seven, seven stories. And um, the planning department and the counselor didn't want affordable housing. Uh, so they didn't. They didn't. Uh, they didn't want us to get the uh, additional three stories. They're they're opposed opposed against it. We ended up getting we ended up getting it approved, and then uh, we just sold out the project because we knew that there was going to be just more issues with with the planning department um, uh, down the road. So that's that's like that's one thing. The city says they want this, but the councilor is like, no, nah, not not in not in my area. I don't want affordable housing. I want it in general, but not in my area. Yeah. Uh, you're you're fighting. You could be fighting with the municipality on a retaining wall or a fence. I, I remember there's two submissions that we have to make, and the same comment came back both times. We don't want a wooden fence. We want a, a stainless steel, nice looking fence. So in the end, we're like, holy shit, okay, really, really, you really care about this fucking fence? <laughs> so we gave them the fence, uh, but it cost like, it cost us like three months because it took them that long to get back to us when we um, we submitted. Uh, well, and, th and they're not talking to each other. You mentioned that before, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so we, it's just, uh, you, you know, requirements, uh, municipal, like they... Their guidelines, but they want you to build a certain number of two and three bedroom units. Uh, you know, some of the areas that we're building, they have a lot of single family homes. They have a lot of two bedrooms and three bedroom units already. They're lacking one bedroom of studios. So when I, you know, you're fighting with municipality, you're showing them the data. I, you know, this area doesn't need any more of these type of units. I'm like, no, we want it. So, you know, in the end, what happens is like uh, the one bedroom and and studios ended up subsidizing the two bedroom and three bedroom units because there, you know, there isn't a demand and people are willing to um, pay a lower price for it. Okay. Wow. So those are some of those are some of the items. Those are some of the issues. 
Well, I'm going to ask you one last question to wrap up here. Um, what do you think is the one key thing that could help incentivize development in Toronto? If there's one, one thing. thing that could push it along, get it, get it back where it needs to be on the rails instead of gearing off. We can make your wish come true. Bobblehead Rob can help you to do make your wishes come true. <laughs> uh, fees. We need to we need to get rid of some of these fees. Um, it's just way it's way too it's way too high. I myself and a few other developers we started like a little coalition trying to um, uh, you know tell the government our provincial, our federal, our municipal government that the fees are too high, we need to lower them. Uh, it, would, it would help, it would spur, it would spur demand because the prices, they kind of overshot. And you have to remember development is a margin business. If we don't make that 10 to 12% margin, we're not gonna sell. We're not gonna sell at a lower price because then we won't get financing. So the land prices can go down a little bit, but there's such a, small portion of your overall budget. Usually it's about three to 5% of the budget is um, the land, whereas the fees are like 36%. So yeah. we need to, the construction prices, they have gone down a little bit, uh, probably like five to 10% the past uh, 12 months, but they're not gonna go down much more. So it's really the only other thing that, that can help with uh, help purchasers, help um, spur more development is fees at this point wow is there something that people could do to help to get involved and and yes. you know, bring it, awareness to this kind of thing speak with your uh counselor your mps send them emails i think that's that's the only way they need to hear it from a lot of people not just a bunch of developers that are making millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars right billions of dollars a billion or whatever no. the perception is uh... <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much, Luke. I appreciate you sharing all this stuff, and we're gonna we'll have you back just to to hear how this um, uh, how those buildings go when you convert them to rentals. I'd like to hear that process as well and see how that goes. Yeah, so, and, um, and how we want to make sure to to like how do people connect with you and and learn more about you know your projects and, and you? Yeah, yeah. So you can uh, connect with me. Um, lch.to is our website. So uh, Lucas, L-U-K-A-S at lch.to, you can email me. Uh, and also for like any kind of, any new developers, uh, people that don't know what they're doing, we also have our development management and construction management services. So we like to get in early. Um, this way, we try to help you throughout the entire process. And it's just so you don't make the same mistakes that we've seen or that we've made personally, that, that could be costly. Oh, that's okay. awesome. I didn't even know you had that service. That's that's great, actually. I'm gonna have to <laughs> yeah. talk to you, that's good. Okay, great. And we'll put the link to that uh, LinkedIn article as well in the show yeah. notes. So if people wanna see that, that's uh, very interesting. Um, it'll be in there in the show notes. And uh, so thanks again, man. Really appreciate yeah. this. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. Quentin, how can yes, people sir. get in touch with you? Oh, you can go to uh, quintindesouza.com. Catch me on uh, um, Instagram. I'm, you can see my travels. That's where I usually post them on Instagram at uh, QMANREI. Or um, uh, you can uh, come out to a Durham REI meeting at durhamrei.com. And how about you, Rob? Awesome. How do people get in touch with you? I think the most important thing that they should do, especially if they're planning any kind of trip to this area, is go to Manta Ray Lodge CR uh, on Facebook or Manta Ray Lodge on Facebook. I can't remember which one it is. Anyways, we're we're like officially unofficially open. Yay. I think we're still waiting Yay, on a few congrats. things, but we're we're accepting guests now. So um go over there look that up and if you're going to be in the area come and spend some time at our hotel so i, I want to do that this winter i, I want to i want to come visit you and and then uh, a friend of mine in mexico so gotta awesome. do that yeah yeah that'll be great please do come down um and also just uh email me at rob at mrbreakthrough.ca that's the best way so thanks everybody for listening and we will talk to you see you interact with you 
learn from you, share with you next time. All right. Take care. Thanks.